the Jewish tie salesman, a fleeing Taliban terrorist desperate for water was plodding through the Afghan desert when he saw something far off in the distance. Hoping to find water, he hurried toward the mirage only to find a very frail little old Jewish man standing at a small makeshift display rack selling ties. The Taliban terrorist asked, do you have water? The Jewish man replied, I have no water. Would you like to buy a tie? <laughs> they are only $5. The Taliban shouted hysterically, idiot, infidel. I do not need such an overpriced Western adornment. I spit on your ties. I need water. Sorry, I have no water. Just ties, pure silk, only $5. Pah! A curse on your ties. I should wrap one around your scrawny little neck and choke the life out of you, but I must conserve my energy and find water. Okay, said the little old Jewish man. It does not matter that you do not want to buy a tie from me or that you hate me, threaten my life, and call me infidel. I will show you that I am bigger than any of that. If you continue over that hill to the east for about two miles, you will find a restaurant. It has the finest food and all the ice cold water you need. Go in peace. Cursing him again, the desperate Taliban staggered away over the hill. Several hours later, he crawled back almost dead, and gasped. They won't let me in without a tie. <laughs> the Jewish tie salesman. All right. I thought it would be uh, helpful and encouraging to you to... Um, wake Cullen up so he can turn the PowerPoint on. <laughs> I want to talk to you in this Sunday School Hour about Jesus Christ, six significant scriptural sketches. And I would encourage you to take a note or two that might be helpful uh, for you. In Shakespeare's famous play, Romeo and Juliet, he has Juliet ask Romeo her well-known question, which I have never been able to understand. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. Do you know what that's talking about? I don't. Are there any uh, English literature students here that can describe this for me. I don't know what it's talking about, but it's an illustration to open the, the lesson. <laughs> Names are significant. They're special. They make a difference. They make it easier to identify people and places. For instance, Annetta told me the other day she wanted to go to the Souk Tar Pits. I said, the souk tar pits. Don't you mean the souk potholes? <laughs> Names make a difference. So, people even go to court over names, get their names changed. Parents sometimes struggle over choosing names for their children. That happened in our situation. When our youngest son was born, and I asked Annetta what we should name him. She said, Timothy Joel. I heard Joel Timothy. So I told the, the nurse, his name is Joel Timothy. And that was the wrong name. But we couldn't get a change because it went down on the official birth certificate. So when we come to the Bible, names are even more significant. For instance, the first human 
created by God, was named Adam because he was taken from the ground, from the dust. His name literally means earth or dirt. God changed Abram's name to Abraham. It means the father of many nations. When God announced to Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a son in their old age, do you remember their reaction? What was their reaction? They laughed. And so they named their son, he laughed. That's what the word Isaac means. And I'm sure every time Isaac walked into the room, Abraham and Sarah remembered that laugh. Methuselah, his name is very significant. The oldest man in the Bible lived to be 969 years of age. His name literally means having died, it comes. And scholars have determined that the very year that the flood of Noah came upon the whole earth was the same year that Methuselah died. So, there's Solomon. We talked about him last week. Shalom, a man of peace. So names make a difference in the Word of God. Perhaps the most important name in all of the Bible are those that are associated with the Lord Jesus. For instance, here's Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And he, she shall bring forth a son, and thou, Joseph, Joseph named him, shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Joshua. Same word, just a different language. Both names mean the Lord saves or the Lord is salvation. So I want to take a look with you in the next few minutes um, at six very special names and titles uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I trust that this will be a blessing and encouragement to you. Number one, Jesus Christ is the special son. He is the special son. Can you quote this verse? Let's all say it together. If you don't know it by memory, you can read it off the PowerPoint. All right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ is special for numbers of reasons. The word begotten found in this verse has nothing to do with physical birth or coming into existence. The word literally means unique, special, one of a kind. And he is special because though God has had only one son, who has never sinned, he has no sons who have never suffered. He is special, unique, one of a kind. Let's look at this word a little more deeply, shall we? Here it is, monogenes. Okay, can you say that word? Monogenes. Now you can tell your friends you know a little Greek, okay? Monogenes, the one and only, the unique, special one. Monogenes actually has two applications, two applications. And I, I don't want this to be complicated, and I'll try to explain this as best that I can. The first application of monogenes in the Bible is that it is a definition pertaining to being the only one of its kind within a specific relationship. The only one of its kind within a special relationship or a unique relationship. Now, don't turn there, but if you were to go to Hebrews 
chapter 11, the faith chapter, verse 17, you would read of Abraham's only begotten son, Isaac. Same word, monogonese, only begotten son. Now, you don't have to know very much about the Bible to know that Abraham had more than one son, didn't he? Yeah, he had several sons. However, Isaac was unique. He was special. He was one of a kind because all of Israel flows out of Isaac and later Jacob. So in that respect, he is Abraham's only begotten son. That's pertaining to being the one and only of its kind within a certain relationship. But there's a second application to monogonese, and this is the one that pertains to the Lord Jesus. Being the only one of its kind or class, unique, special, this is John 3.16, monogenes, only begotten, demonstrating that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God the Son. He is the only one who is God the Son. Now, God has many sons. We're all sons of God, but we're not monogenes sons of God. We're not unique and special. We're all alike, but Jesus is different. And I would say, hallelujah, what a special son we have, our Lord and Savior. Secondly, Jesus Christ is the select servant. You probably get the idea that I like to use alliteration. The select servant. Notice Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So let me ask you a question. Who is Isaiah referring to? When he talks about the select servant, who's he referring to? Jesus, right? Not Israel. The Jews believe that Isaiah was talking about the Jewish people. But we know from the New Testament, giving us further understanding, that this is talking about the, the, uh, the uh, prophesied Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Now, here's what's interesting. Notice that he is referred to here as elect. God's son is God's elect. Now that may surprise you. God's son is his chosen one. That's what the word elect means. His chosen one. The one whom God has selected to accomplish some specific purposes in his life. And it implies that God has designated or appointed him, he's selected him, he's elected him for a great purpose. Now, as I said last week, I understand fully that the doctrine of election is very controversial. I, I understand that. But I want to show you something that you may not understand or may not comprehend that I think will help you sort out this whole doctrine of election. Are you aware that in the Bible there are four and only four entities that are described in Scripture as God's elect? Only four. And I have them listed here for you. Israel, as a nation, was called God's chosen people, God's selected, elect people. Angels, according to 1 Timothy. 
the church, and Christ. Now, what do they all have in common? Well, let me, let me answer the question by telling you what they don't have in common. They don't have in common salvation. For instance, all of Israel, most of Israel in the Old Testament were unbelievers, unsaved, heathen. Yet God calls the nation his elect. Angels are not in need of salvation. The church and then Christ. Christ is not in need of salvation. He's the Savior, yet he's called the elect. So what do they all have in common? They're all chosen to serve God. Israel was God's servant. Angels are God's servants. The church is God's servant. And Christ is God's servant. And so each of them, including Christ, was chosen to serve God. And when you arrive at the greatest prophetic chapter in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53, you discover that this select servant becomes the suffering servant, dying for us so that we could become God's select servants as well. Hallelujah. What a select servant. So let's think thirdly about Isaiah chapter 53. Jesus Christ is the suffering servant. The suffering servant. Now, I don't want to belabor this because we just don't have the time, but I want you to understand that there are two outstanding themes that permeate the 53rd chapter of Isaiah and, and are emphasized. Those two themes are sacrifice and substitution. Sacrifice and substitution. Both of those propositions are described in verses 4 and 5 of Isaiah 53. Surely, certainly, obviously, he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was wounded, there's the sacrifice part, for our transgressions, wounded for, wounded sacrifice for substitution, our transgressions. He was bruised for our rebellions. That's literally what the word iniquities means, rebellions. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripe, it's singular in the Hebrew, with his stripe, we are healed. The word stripe here means bruise, wound, or welt. In fact, if you were to go back up into the previous chapter, chapter 52, right at the end of the chapter, you would discover that Isaiah described this suffering servant and said he was so marred, so broken, so wounded, so bruised, that he was not recognizable as a human being. You can read it for yourself. So when you see these paintings of Jesus 
on the cross, and he has a little trickle of blood here and a, a little drop of blood there. No. He was not even recognizable after the Romans got done with him. Now, I'm, I know that most of you are not students of theology. I understand that. But I want to make you aware of something. There is the doctrine of substitution. One person taking the place of another person. That's the doctrine of substitution. You're substituting Christ for yourself. That's called the substitutionary atonement. That doctrine is under withering attack in the church today. Not this church, but the, the church in its broadest definition. It's being attacked relentlessly and being denied by more and more churches that Jesus really didn't substitute himself. And I have had online discussions with people who are promoting this, and I'm telling you, you cannot get to first base with these people. So we cherish the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. He died my death that I might live his life. He died in my place. And you don't need any other proof than this verse. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just, the righteous, for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. Man of sorrows, what a name, for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished, was his cry, now in heaven lifted high. Hallelujah, what a suffering Savior. Amen? Amen. The fourth sketch is Jesus Christ is the supreme sovereign. He is the supreme sovereign. What do we mean by that? Jesus is the king over all other kings. He is the Lord over all other lords. That's what the phrase means, king of kings, lord of lords. Literally, king over all other kings, lord over all other lords. King Charles has a king, doesn't he? His name is Jesus. He's the king over all other earthly kings. And one day... He will rule and reign over his creation and over his creatures. And his reign will be perfect in every way. And Jesus will not be promoting climate change as the King of England is doing these days and all sorts of other nonsensical things. He's going to reign in perfect righteousness perfect justice, perfect in all that he is, perfect in all that he does. Now, the last three mentions of the kingship of Jesus Christ are all found in the book of Revelation. I have them here on the PowerPoint. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Then, in chapter 17, verse 
14, John writes, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Aren't you glad you've read the last book in the Bible? We win. We win. All of this other nonsense that's going on in the world today, all of this cultural sin, it's all going to go away when the king comes to defeat it all. Revelation 19.11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. And then the chapter climaxes in verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. What a supreme sovereign. Number five. Jesus Christ is the supernatural sustainer. The supernatural sustainer. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 17 are stunning. Notice what the Apostle Paul wrote. Who, referring back to Christ in the previous verse, that's a personal pronoun, the antecedent goes back to Christ. Who, or Christ, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, these are the four ranks of angels that he's giving you here, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist." Now, how many of you have ever tried to talk to a Jehovah's Witness? Get anywhere? Yeah. I was telling somebody after the morning service that the thing that I have found most effective is not discussing all of their doctrinal quirks, but giving your personal salvation testimony. Because, you know, they can stand at the door and argue with you all day long, but they cannot argue a changed life. But I want to show you what the Jehovah's Witnesses do with this passage of Scripture. Okay? Let's look at it again. Starting in verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all other things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions and principalities or powers, all other things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. They just slipped that little word other into the passage two times. Does that change the meaning of the, of the passage? Oh, yes, because they believe that Jesus is a created being. And that after God created him, then he created everything else. All other things were created by him. And I counter that argument by this. First of all, the word other is not in the Greek either time. They just simply invented it. But the second thing is, if Jesus created all things, he created himself. Stop and think about that. If he created all things, then he must have created himself. 
Well, of course, that's preposterous. So don't let the Jehovah's Witnesses pull that trick on you if you have an opportunity to talk to them. Firstborn. Let's talk about this word firstborn. This particular word does not describe the origin of Christ. That is his beginning or his creation. The word is talking about his sovereignty, his priority over all of creation. The word literally means one who is in first place, one who is first in rank, one who is first in supremacy or priority. And if you have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 1, and you just glance down at verse 18, right at the end of the verse, where Paul says, and he is the head of the church, and then he says that in all things he might have the what? The what? The preeminence. It's the same word translated firstborn earlier in the context. Same word. So you could read the verse, verse, who is the image of the invisible God, the one who has highest rank or priority or preeminence over every creature. And why does he have preeminence over every creature? Because he's the creator. He's the creator. So Jesus Christ is the paramount one of all of creation. He's the one who holds first place in all of these things. One author in a commentary I studied for this message said, the word firstborn has nothing to do with the first Christmas. Nowhere does the Bible teach that Jesus began in Jerusalem or in Bethlehem. His physical being began there, but not his person. His person has always existed. He's God. The Bible does not teach. Uh, the Bible does teach that he was from everlasting. He existed before creation. This passage is not talking about his birth as a creature, but his existence as God himself. Now, there's something else that's amazing in this passage. And it's the word consist at the end of verse 17. What does this mean when Paul writes, and by him all things consist? The word consist means to hold together, to stick, to cohere, or to adhere. Now, what does that mean? In the old days, when I was in school, we had what was called chalkboards. Do anybody of you remember chalkboards? Gordon, you didn't go to school. Oh, no. I don't think they use chalkboards anymore. They use whiteboards, uh, and they use um, felt, felt, yeah, or the computer. Yeah, chalkboards? I mean, they went out with the 8-track cassettes. How was it possible that when somebody wrote words on a chalkboard that the words didn't slide down into the chalk tray. What kept them there? Jesus kept them there. That's what the verse says, isn't it? By him all things adhere or cohere. You know from science in high school that everything is made of atoms, right? Atoms, right? Atoms. There are atoms in this Bible. There are atoms in the chair you're sitting in. There are atoms in your clothes. There are atoms in the wall. 
that are at, your, your entire body is held together by atoms, what keeps them all together? The answer is Jesus is keeping them all together. How do you know that? Colossians 1.17 says, By him all things are held together. So, gravitation that keeps things in their fixed places, that's all controlled by Jesus Christ. He regulates the motion of all moving objects, and all of it is the work of his power. Now, what would happen if, for example, what would happen if all of the atoms in this pulpit were released, what would happen? You say it louder. The pulpit would disintegrate. It would disintegrate. And the same would be true of your clothes. They would burn up. I believe in global warming and the Big Bang. I'll just let that sink in for just a second. I believe in the global warming and the Big Bang. And they're both found in 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm not talking about the foolishness of the evolutionary Big Bang. And I'm not talking about Al Gore's nonsense about global warming. Okay? I'm talking about God's global warming and Big Bang. It's going to take place at the end of time. And there is going to be a huge explosion. Right? All of the elements of the universe are going to be on fire, Peter says. You know why? Because there is coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to simply let go. And everything is going to disintegrate. And out of that, God will create a new heaven and a new earth. So, we believe that Jesus Christ is the controlling influence in the universe. Don't miss that. He's the controlling force in the universe. And please, please, if you are in the habit of referring to Mother Nature, wash your mouth out with soap. There is no such woman. There is Father Nature. His name is Jesus. Okay? And Mother Nature is a figment of evolution, not of the Bible. He's the energy in the entire universe. He guarantees that the universe is not only controlled, but not chaotic. So, do you see why making Jesus Christ less than God, some created deity, do you see why that's blasphemous, utter blasphemous, and demeaning to his deity? Do you comprehend that the same one who has that kind of power to hold all things together, that that same one has the, the same power? Oh, excuse me. <laughs> the same power. <laughs> the same power to sustain and strengthen your life. Yeah, the same one. Regardless of your circumstances or condition. And if Jesus Christ can manage and supervise the trillions of stars in the heavens and coordinate all of the constellations and the planets in their orbits, 
There is nothing in your life that he can't handle either. Nothing. John Phillips has an interesting, engaging illustration I think I'd like to share with you. Our sun, for instance, is just a moderate star as stars go, yet it is pouring energy into space with the utmost abundance. Losing weight by radiation at the rate of 4 billion 200 million tons a second. This enormous output of sheer physical energy is so well controlled that our planet never gets too hot, never gets too cold, but remains at proper mean temperature to sustain life. Life as we know it can exist only within a very narrow margin of temperature. If it were to get hotter, for a little longer, the whole world would become a vast Sahara desert. If it were to get colder for a little longer, the whole world would become a frozen Arctic. Someone set the thermostat, and that someone is Jesus. And then he concludes, he controls the universe just as he did when he lived on earth. The forces of nature owned his presence and his power. Water blushed into wine when he looked at it. Loaves and fishes multiplied in his hands. Raging seas hushed to rest at his command. Howling winds hushed to sleep. At his will, rolling waves became a pavement beneath his feet, an unbroken colt. colt submitted instantly to his touch. Fishes hurled themselves into Peter's net at the sound of his voice. He created the universe. He claims the universe. He controls the universe. All the entities of space, matter, and time are in his hands. All the forces of nature, all the factors in the total equation of eternity and time are at his command. I say, hallelujah. What a su supernatural sustainer. Lastly, number six, Jesus Christ is the sacrificial shepherd. The sacrificial shepherd. The Bible gives us four portraits of the shepherd in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give them to you quickly as we conclude. First of all, Jesus is the guiding shepherd. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Notice now, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He says it again. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And brethren, that is the only path that Jesus will lead you. The path of righteousness. He will not lead you in any other path. If you want to go your own way, he will not lead you there. He is the guiding shepherd. Secondly, he is the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Usually it was the sheep that gave their life for the shepherd. But here, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Thirdly, he is the governing shepherd. The governing shepherd. Peter writes in the last chapter of his first epistle, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, 
and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, that means not for monetary gain, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, that's the church, but being examples to the flock. And when the governing shepherd, that's literally what that word chief means, archagon, the head shepherd, the governing shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. That's a special crown reserved exclusively for pastors. And lastly, Jesus is the great shepherd. He's not only the guiding shepherd, the good shepherd, and the governing shepherd. He's the great shepherd. Hebrews chapter 13, last couple of verses of the epistle. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect, complete literally, in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. What a sacrificial shepherd. So those are six significant scriptural sketches. There are many more, but we don't have time to go through all of them, about the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust it'll be a blessing to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these moments together now. And we thank you for our Savior and our Lord, our Master, our Owner, our Controller. And I pray, Father, that there would not be an unsubmissive bone in our bodies, but that we would always be fully yielded and surrendered to the authority of Jesus Christ. And as Paul said in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, on the basis of the mercies of God, that you offer up your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto you, and that we be not conformed to this world, but that we would be transformed through the renewing of our minds so that we can prove and approve of the good and perfect will of God. I pray that you would bless our fellowship at the mealtime and the afternoon service for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.